My name is Ted Ross. I'm General Manager of the Information Technology Agency, and I certainly want to welcome you to the Google Learn event that we're having this morning. Uh, the first question, I'm going to ask a couple questions. The first question I have for you is it's going to be a show of hands. Give me a show of hands. How many of you would say that you work mostly in IT? Show of hands. Okay. Give me a show of hands for those who say mostly you don't work in IT. Good. Excellent. A good mixed audience. Um, it's really interesting working and managing the information technology agency, they'll often say, oh, hey, we're the technology people. But when you really think about the last 20 years, hasn't technology kind of become everyone's job? Do any of you work with something that has no technology involved? Even a person who takes care of like our urban forest, who like trims trees and manages those things, they still enter their time into a system, they still get paid by the systems. There's so many different aspects of technology that integrate with probably every type of job that we do. I'm also going to ask another quick question, and now, now, and don't call this ageism, I know I look young, but I'm going to ask this question. How many of you remember having a job or starting a job in which there was no computer assigned to you? I remember. Okay? So you remember when the introduction of that computer was, when it showed up, right? You used to have a job that didn't even have a computer associated. And for those of you who are young and may not remember that, it happened. There was a time where you sat down at a desk and there was no computer there. In fact, at the city of Los Angeles, we used to have a position called a clerk slash typist. And they were called the typist because you hand wrote something. You handed it to them, they typed it. And then they showed you a draft, you made adjustments, and you handed it back to them because they were the one with the computer and you were someone who did not. And with the introduction of the computer, the computer started to change the role of how we worked, right? Like I'll never forget, once that computer was introduced, I said to myself, what screen should I be on? Where do I start? And I started to create my own little thing. And you all have your own little routines too. I always have a routine where I have my email inbox, I have Excel or Word available, or I have Google Docs up and then I'll go ahead and have internet available. That's my routine. But for all of you, you picked up a routine of how you start your day and how you interact with your desktop. Now, if we look maybe over the last five, six, seven years, you shifted, you may all have a laptop instead of a desktop. Or you have a smartphone and a laptop, or a smartphone, a tablet, a laptop, and you say you have all this combination, so the computing devices you have available then shifted. So it wasn't just a desktop centrally controlled and sitting in one place, you now have computing devices in many places. And you start to use various types of apps. So over the last 10 plus years, you end up with various kinds of applications to do the work that you do. But there's another really big change coming down the pipeline, and that's AI. Artificial intelligence and machine learning is a complete transformation that is both started and it's on its way. So it's not just you with various kinds of devices and various kinds of apps, but there's another brain assisting you. And we're going to have the folks at Google who are going to be discussing this in greater detail. Who here has seen the Terminator movie? You know where I'm going with this. Do you think artificial intelligence is a conversation that will lead to the end of man and womankind? OK, some of you do, right? Right? You know, you go to enough of these movies that you really do feel like aliens really are coming and all these other aspects. But the reality is, what artificial intelligence, if you would ask me, and, I, and, I, and I'm not going to steal any of Google's thunder, you're going to have hours of good discussion here on this topic. But in a lot of ways, artificial intelligence isn't so much a brain that replaces your brain, but there are additional tools that augment what you can do. For those of you who remember life before a computer, the computer transformed the way you worked. For those of you who remember life where it was just a desktop computer, but then it switched to smartphone, tablet, laptop, desktop, and a combination of all those, whether you know it or not, that changed the way you worked. Artificial intelligence will change the way we work. And I like to say thank you to you because you are spending the time and energy to figure out how it will change your work. Artificial intelligence is not a conversation around the replacement of humans and their jobs. Humans will have jobs, a lot of jobs. Artificial intelligence, or an expression I've really started to adapt, is augmented intelligence. These are tools that augment how you work, the same way apps augment how you work, and the computer augmented how you work. They will be new tools and new capabilities that can change the way you work, that allows you to be a human to do those things that humans do best, but allows computers to do ever more to reduce the burden on you, to reduce a workload on you, to allow you to be the human that you are, 
and to be a great human at that. So it's a very interesting conversation, but it also can be a tense one. And it also reinforces the importance of what we call digital ethics. We are not just letting technology just take everything over, and at the end of the day, we look back and say, oh my gosh, I didn't realize this is what we've all become. At the city of Los Angeles, we try to be forward thinking. We try to be smart when it comes to how we leverage our technology, what technologies they use, and what impacts it has on people. So with that, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Joseph Lay. And so uh, needless to say, when we discuss the idea of emerging technologies, when we discuss artificial intelligence and machine learning and what it is and what it isn't, a company like Google, and I'm not giving a Google endorsement, but a company like Google is very much on the cutting edge in those conversations. So I feel we're honored to have Google to come and speak to us regarding these topics. So whether you work in IT and it's your job to bring technology into your department, or whether you're somebody who doesn't work primarily in IT, who simply has to use technology to make your department better and stronger and provide more quality and more equity in the services that we provide as a city, I hope and I think you're going to get a lot out of this. So thank you, and I'd like to introduce you to Joseph. Let's give him a round of applause. Hello and good morning. My name is Joseph Lay. I am the customer engineer for the city of Los Angeles. And just a little bit of background about myself. Um, prior to joining Google, I spent about four years at the state of California, where I was a state employee focusing on digital service delivery as well as uh, data systems and analytics. I also spent the majority of my life growing up in Los Angeles, so I'm very, very proud to be back here sharing this material with you today. So as Ted mentioned, we'll be talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning, or I'll also be referring to it as AI ML today. So it's no surprise that a company like Google considers itself a machine learning company. An artificial intelligence-based company, as our CEO Sundar Pichai shares, machine learning is a core transformative way by which we're rethinking how we're doing everything. Starting back in 2015 and 2016, we announced our driving strategy for AI first, and we can see this coming to fruition in platforms such as Google Assistant, as well as the Google Android operating systems, Google Home, enabling users to ask questions and perform actions in their native languages as well as their natural languages all across the world. This powers Google hardware as well as Android phones, and since then, Google has been focusing on integrating AI and ML into every product that we produce. You can see here on this graph of Google products incorporating the Google Brain model from the time we implemented in about two years from 2016 to 2017, the adoption has almost tripled to 7,000 projects. You can see on this screen, eight of Google products now have over 1 billion monthly active users, due largely in part to the features derived from artificial intelligence and machine learning. With the proliferation and expansion of professions in data science, you may hear about AI and ML being used in almost every aspect of our lives and touching almost everything that we do in IT as well as other aspects of our lives. So many folks may hear about AI and ML, but using different terms such as smart cities. We also hear about things like IoT, also known as Internet of Things. And also some folks may refer to it as cloud because the public cloud is a big portion of what enables the delivery of artificial intelligence and machine learning. The truth is AI and ML really does touch every portion of all of our lives. So by a quick show of hands here, who recognizes or uses these services and brands? Okay. I think that's basically everyone in the room. And each and every one of these services and brands utilizes AI and ML to deliver the experience that billions have experienced across the world and know and love. This is done with constructs such as recommendation engines and personalization engines and even features as sim seemingly simple as autocomplete and spell check. And by the way, all of these services and Google are Google products or customers that utilize Google to deliver their AI and ML features. Machine learning creates not only competitive edge for government, it creates significant business value. As you can see here from an MIT survey done in 2017, Organizations that apply mach machine learning saw two times more data-driven decisions. They saw 5x faster decisions 
and 3x faster execution. A brief example, at cities like the city of Los Angeles that utilize G Suite and Google services, employees utilizing a tool such as Smart Compose, which allows users to, with one keystroke, complete a sentence or a thought, might save five to 10 seconds, right? Not really a huge amount of time, but when we're talking about enterprises like the city of Los Angeles, across the number of users that we have and the number of times that this is used every single day, this really enables the organization to scale. So a quick look ahead, we're gonna be discussing what AI and ML is from a high level perspective. I'm also gonna be sharing examples of how machine learning can be used in general. And then we're gonna go in to talk about how machine learning and artificial intelligence is used in government today and looking towards the future. We wanna bring these services to government to benefit our constituents and today we're gonna to discuss the ways that that works. Lastly, we're gonna conclude with how Google can partner with the city to make this a continued reality. So when folks hear the phrase data science, artificial intelligence, or machine learning, there's commonly a perception that practitioners need to have A, a lot of data, B, a PhD in complex applied mathematics, linear algebra, and C, that leads to unique magical results, or sometimes as we refer to it, Google magic. And for that definition, I wanna take a quick step back and kinda of touch briefly on what Ted was discussing earlier. Artificial, and, and artificial intelligence and machine learning starts with optimization and automation of that optimization. Again, artificial intelligence is not about replacing humans, it's not about making robots replace humans, and it's not about building Skynet. It's about improving the tools and the processes that we have to make our products and our services better. So we broadly define artificial intelligence as the science of making things smart. And while that's a very generic definition, it's kind of the basis for what we're discussing here today. Moving on to implementation, the how of how do we implement artificial intelligence, we use machine learning to do that. And that's where machine learning comes in. And what machine learning allows for us to do is to teach a computer to learn from data instead of syntactically programming in rules. So back, we, back in the days, we had punch card machines where we would program the logic based on binary or conditional logic. But with machine learning, what we're doing is we're teaching machines to learn how to do a particular task by providing it with input data and having it create a model for us to utilize. As an example for everyone in the room who I imagine uses email, a great example of this is spam filtering. So back when spam filtering was, was coming, becoming a thing, many times that folks would program rules like if it is from this sender, this is always spam. Otherwise, this is not spam. But for the employees of the city of Los Angeles, as well as the billions of people who use Gmail, we now have spam filters that are based on classification and heuristics based on machine learning. And as a result, almost no spam is being delivered into Gmail inboxes today. So what does this actually look like? What are the, some of the things that can be done with artificial intelligence and machine learning? You can play board games. For folks who are familiar with the game Go, it's arguably the most complex board game ever created by mankind. And by applying machine learning and training on hundreds of thousands of amateur games and redefining the models of those games, a Google DeepMind algorithm was able to successfully win against Grandmaster Lee Sedol in 2016. Or what about this image here on my left? Most of us looking carefully at this photo would be relatively easily be able to recognize this photo as a photo of a dog curled up in a laundry basket taking a nap. On the right side, you'll see a depiction of how machine learning uses neural networks to train a model to be able to recognize whether this is a dog or a cat, and as we say, it's more accurately, is it a dog or is it not a dog at the, ultimate, at the highest level of the neurons. So by feeding it tens, hundreds, and thousands of training examples, we can now teach the computer to build a model to determine whether this is a dog or not. So this is in contrast to writing a computer program that would, for example, we would feed rules to say, hey, let's recognize this dog based on what we know to, or how we know a dog to be. For example, it has four feet, it has a tail, it has a really cute face, it has fur. Um, that would be an example of rules-based or logic-based determination of whether something was a dog or not. 
And so you can see at the very top of that neural network, the two neurons will emit whether at the, at the end of this, within a confidence threshold, whether it believes that this is a dog or it's not a dog. So it may seem like a trivial example, um, but this model can be used for things to answer questions such as these two examples. <laughs> Are we able to differentiate between caramel macchiato vanilla ice cream or a kitten? And on the right-hand side, you'll see the differentiation between a chihuahua and a blueberry muffin. <laughs> or what about this example here, right? You think it would be a very easy exercise to differentiate between a dog and a mop. We've seen that this is not so easy. <laughs> so these are trivial examples, but there are many applications of this exact same technology in the private sector as well as in government, and we're going to touch on that in short order. So we've seen how machine learning can be used and applied to images. By show of hands, who here thinks that we can apply this to other formats of, of data? What about streaming audio, video? Okay, a couple, about half the audience. Awesome. So in this animation, you can see here we have a video of kids playing in a field. We see that it's detecting people, it's detecting animals, it's detecting horses in the back. And interesting, with an ML overlay model, it's categorizing what it sees. When you see the video zoom in, you can see, it's, it's quite interesting, you see that it initially thinks that the bird is a dog. And as the video zooms in, the model correctly recognizes, based on the factors that are coming through in this frame, I now understand that this is, this is a bird. We're going to refer back to that example in just a couple slides from now to show how that's actually being used in government today. Here you can see satellite aerial imagery and what looks like white patches of snow covering mountaintops. The company Airbus wrote a machine learning model that would analyze these photos and be able to detect what is snow, what is land cover versus what is a cloud. And they're using these to improve the, the resolution of their photography for their use. What's interesting is that with their software and over two decades of refinement, Airbus had a detection error margin of about 13%. So that means that over 20 years of work refining models to, to accurately detect and remove cloud cover from these aerial silo imagery, they got an improvement of 13% error detection rate. With a new approach utilizing machine learning, one analyst using Google Cloud AutoML in six months reduced the error rate down to less than 4%. That's huge. Moving on to energy and conservation, Google has been running some of the world's largest and most powerful data centers in the, in the past 10 plus years. We strive to make these data centers as efficient as possible, and to that end, we have full-time engineers dedicated to this particular task. We've placed a huge emphasis on reducing the environmental impact of these data centers and after 10 years of optimization, I'm proud to say that we've reduced the average annual energy overhead by about 12%. So if you look at the graph here, the overhead is the energy required to power the building itself that houses the servers that Google has in our data centers. So we were understandably very pleasantly surprised when one of our data center engineers, in conjunction with Google DeepMind, was able to create a machine learning based cooling optimization for the data centers during summertime. And with that, we were able to reduce the energy footprint by 40%. So let me say that again. In under one year, we were able, in overhead energy consumption, to reduce that by 40% with one machine learning model versus 10 years of work that generated a 12% reduction. As you can see on this slide, the applications of artificial intelligence across manufacturing, retail, healthcare, and other industry verticals is extremely prevalent and can lead to amazing benefits for all. So what does this mean for government? I'd like to take some time to share the ways that artificial intelligence and machine learning is being used in government today and looking towards the future. So going back to the animation I showed you earlier, I want folks to kind of Look at this animation to understand what's going on with the machine learning model being overlaid on top of this video. 
I'm going to play a separate video, and what you're seeing here is taken from a legacy camera that's not smart, it's not machine learning enabled, operated by the Colorado Department of Transportation, and the feed is now integrated and backed with Google Cloud Platform components. The model is optimized to detect different types of vehicles, from passenger cars to trucks and buses, the same way that in this previous animation we saw that it was detecting birds, dogs, horses, and people. The machine learning technology can be used for It could be used for traffic counting and flow pattern recognition for determining timing and how to best utilize our roadways. It could be used for accident prevention as well as detection and accelerated dispatch for accidents. And this can also be used for roadway predictive maintenance. Here you're going to see another video of the same road but with a bounding green box on the left hand side of the screen. You'll notice the car, that as the cars are passing through this box on the upper left hand corner. I'm going to point to it here with my mouse. The, that cars are detected, and the system is unique, able to uniquely tag and count the cars as they pass. One thing that's not immediately evident from this video here is that the system is capturing not only the count of vehicles, but the flow, the vehicle speed, and the road conditions. And it's not doing that just by the green box. It's doing that per lane. And so this is a huge game changer for government in the applications for transportation. What we're doing is we're up-leveling the legacy cameras that we already have with trained machine learning models. We can automate and scale to not only count cars, but detect the contributing factors to fatal crashes. So for example, what creates a car accident? We have excess speed, we have roadways that are the where the conditions are not the best, and we also have traffic density. So by utilizing these signals that government has already and overlaying machine learning efficiency on top of this, we're able to scale this, right? Not only we're we able to count cars, but we can take the data gathered by, by flow speed as well as historical accidents and reporting data and use that to prevent the loss of life and property. So this is huge, and we're very, very excited about this. AI-enabled systems such as these inform winter operations. It also informs inter- and intra-governmental data sharing and governance. Streaming video, which we just discussed and also infrastructure planning, looking towards the future. And in this case, machine learning allows us to leverage the limited resources that we have to unlock the value of government data that we have available today. We can improve our operational efficiency as well as make data-driven decisions. This work is underway today, and Google really looks forward to partnering with the city to bring this to a roadway near you soon. Moving on, we're here in the city of Los Angeles, which in addition, being, in addition to being the city of Los Angeles is also part of the county of Los Angeles as well as the state of California. So another use case that I'd like to share is the work that Google has done with the California Secretary of State to train a model, custom auto machine learning model, that is being used to more quickly and accurately translate voter materials and election information that's being used in elections going forward. I'm also proud to share that by utilizing this machine learning technology, in December 2018, the California Secretary of State, in conjunction with the California Archives, published the first multilingual arts and culture exhibit in its history using this custom auto machine learning technology. The exhibit features a history of voting by mail during the Civil War, and courtesy of machine learning is now, now available to native Spanish speakers. Switching gears back to the Airbus example from earlier, governments could also apply the same techniques to improve image fidelity for uses such as land survey, zoning, et cetera. With the upcoming 2020 census, this is an area that we see governments could utilize technologies such as this to ensure a full count of their constituents. And lastly, as we saw from the beginning of this presentation, this technology enables the future of constituent facing digital services such as Google, Google Home, Google Hub, Google Assistant, and Android-based phones. Self-service in all form factors, such as those digital assistants, chatbots, and online consumption of government services. So what if instead of standing in line at the DMV, you could pre-apply and fill out documentation for renewing driver's license 
at home on a digital system such as these Google systems, Google Home Hub and Assistant on Android, the same way that you can now use these services to do something such as check into your flight and confirm your seating arrangement. With just your voice, it really should be that easy, and with machine learning, it can be. In many cases, ultimately, the final touch may be required, but by leveraging machine learning, we can drive the efficiency and the level at which we deliver services to our constituents. As, as I'm sure many of the folks in the room are thinking, this all sounds great, but how do we do this? How do we do machine learning and go from a concept, this idea of artificial intelligence, and make this into a reality for our government services? As you can see here on this slide, that in terms of technology, there are multiple levels of effort, and there are many ways that we can abstract that effort or reduce the amount of effort needed to leverage the managed services and tools with machine learning built in. However, as we've found, we've often found that the process of change happens at the people and the skills level. And we found that in order for this to be successful, it's absolutely critical to engage at the people and skills level to really share that methodology. And this applies not only to our artificial intelligence and machine learning, but to anything, any project that we want to make successful to consider the different aspects, right? We want to consider the education, the computational resources available to us, the systems by which we do that, and having a framework to make that into a successful deployment. So for the sharing that I have today, that concludes my portion. I'm going to be sharing, passing the baton over to Ryan Mulholland, who's with Google. He's the person leading Google's extensive ecosystem to share about how Google makes machine learning work and how we can make this vision a reality. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. My name is uh, Ryan Mulholland, as Joseph said. Can you hear me okay? I think I'm a little taller than the microphone. Um, anyhow, my name is Ryan Mulholland, and I have this distinct privilege of, of serving as the team lead for Google's professional services arm that supports our customers in state and local government. Uh, so it's a real privilege to be here with you today. I get to fly in this morning from D.C. so that I could spend some time with you with you and the, the Googlers that are here with you today to, to talk a little bit about machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm curious, I, I like interactive conversations more than anything, so I'm curious, can anybody name something that they think is probably at least aided by machine learning that they use in their day-to-day -day life? I'm sorry? Shazam. Shazam. Shazam, okay, anything else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah? Any other ideas? Anybody use Google Maps? Have you noticed how if you put an address in, it will tell you how long it thinks it's going to take you to get there? And even show you red areas where it looks like traffic is backed up and you're going to be slowed down? Little things. I think as Joseph mentioned, you wouldn't think how much work it actually takes to do things like uh, autocorrect in Gmail or to calculate how long it's going to take you to get from one place to another, let alone if you get on, on our uh, MAPS website and you tell it, I want to arrive at 9 o'clock tomorrow night, what time do I have to leave? And to be reasonably accurate, so to help guide you to a place where you can leave at the right time and still get where you need to be and be on time. There's a lot of work that goes in behind that and it can seem very, very daunting. And my team's job really is to help you demystify that. Our favorite ask ever is, I've got this challenge, how would you? So I'm curious, have you ever thought about what it would be like if you could take a city bus, put a camera on the front of it, and in a matter of a few weeks have most of the streets in the city of Los Angeles covered and you would know where every pothole was, how wide they were, and how deep they were? <laughs> how much time would that save? These are tools that you can bring to bear here in the city of Los Angeles. These are the tools that you, each of you, can leverage, take advantage of, and do so much more. Um, that example is one that we're trying out with the city now. It's a great way to tackle a really big problem that most cities really have a hard time uh, dealing with. Some of you probably have potholes that you've named already that you see every day on the way to work. <laughs> And they're hard, right? It's a challenge. Every municipality struggles to keep up with challenges like that and how you deal with them. 
So our job from the very beginning to the very end really is to sit down in, in concert with folks like Joseph and Chris and Andy who are also here from Google today, do some discovery with you, learn about the challenge that you're facing, and our job is to help you explore potential solutions. How might we actually tackle a problem? And I say how might we because that's actually the way Google tackles problems. Those three little words is how we begin some of the biggest problems that Google tackles. And it's the same way that we work with you to tackle those problems. Our job ultimately is to help you find and identify ways to solve big problems, leveraging any number of tools, not the least of which is artificial intelligence and machine learning, and then discover how we might use them in order to tackle those problems. So one of the examples that Joseph shared with you was actually some work that we, we have done and are doing with the Colorado Department of Transportation. So one of the lead uh, folks with CDOT, we, we were having a conversation as we were kicking off our first engagement. And I was talking with John, and John said, we have great equipment for departments of transportation, but it's old. Like the new tech that we installed last week is built on the same tech that we were deploying 20 years ago. How cool would it be, <coughs> how cool would it be if we could decide how many cars were in every lane at any given point in time, how fast they were moving, and what those road conditions were like. But we have over a thousand cameras spread out across the state of Colorado, and they've been there for a long time. We've made that investment. Does it make sense to rip all of those out and put new cameras in to pull off that, that feat? So as Joseph pointed out, the camera that was used for the demonstration that you saw was an old legacy camera. It was the same camera that, that's been there for five years. It's the same camera that's there today. And we just took that video stream and began to try and understand what was being presented to it. We put a box on there because we know how long, how long a stripe on a road is. And so we know how fast the vehicle is going relative to how fast they pass a stripe on the road. And we start to make some decisions. Life saving is a big deal. Uh, in states where they have snow and ice, it's critical. Every year they, use, they lose lots of folks to car crashes because of snow and ice. But what Colorado knows and what every state knows generally is that there are a series of mitigating factors that help to determine whether or not a fatal crash is likely. So what if you could say, I've got five lanes of travel. Each lane of travel is going roughly this fast. Road conditions are this. These other conditions that we know likely indicate a fatal crash is going to occur are building. And what if we could take that data and immediately influence the overhead signs to say, slow down now, dangerous conditions exist? Could we influence drivers and effectively save lives? So our challenge on the professional services side is to sit down with you, discover, ask questions, learn about what you do, learn how you do it, and help to provide thoughtful feedback on ways that you can tackle that problem. And when it's appropriate, we dive in with you. We augment the skills that you already have on hand. We dive in and we love to solve big problems. So given the opportunity, talk about the challenges that you have and how they might be solved. And that's the favorite, that's the favorite beginning to every conversation that I think all of us have. I've got this problem. How would you tackle it? And we'd love to dive in with you. So thank you very much. Hi, my name is Charlene Dennis. I work with ITA and part of the Team Innovate group. Welcome and thank you guys for coming out. Right now we're going to take some questions for Google. And the way the questions are going to work is we only have one microphone, so we'll stand up in the middle of the section there. And you might want to raise your hand or just walk out there and it'll be easier if you walk out so that if you have questions we could address it and the Googlers will uh, address your questions that way. As folks are coming up, I um, feel like we should introduce ourselves as well. Um, so my name is Chris Hine. Uh, so I have the good fortune of managing our engineering team that focuses on state and local government. I've been with Google for um, a little over five years now. Um, and so, yeah, excited to, to talk with you all uh, about any questions. And we also have Andy. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I wanted to say thank you for joining us today and uh, spending some of your day to learn a little bit more about what Google's doing. Um, obviously, the city is a longtime Google customer. And we're really excited about the opportunities and, and things that we can do to help the city really achieve its mission and better serve our residents. Um, much like Joseph, I grew up in LA, 
I was baptized at uh, Olvera Street, so I'm very happy to be back here. Um, again, Andy Velasquez, and I'm your uh, Google account executive. Testing. We can always have people shout their questions out, and then we can respond them back over the you microphone. Have questions in the meantime, just raise your hands, and hopefully we'll, everyone can hear. You can in the front, the we have a question here. So um, you gave the, a wonderful example about the Google Maps and, and how you're using um, technology to be able to solve those issues. Could you list what are the top five things that Google has already addressed that they're working on in terms of uh, artificial intelligence and how to solve it, those kinds of problems? Does that make any sense? Top five. I've got a good example. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. So we're working with San Joaquin County to... Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was loud enough. Um, so, so we're working with San Joaquin County, and, and the use case there is the placement of foster care kids into homes that can help them. Something traumatic has already happened to them, and unfortunately, the way the system is set up, it's all a paper-driven system, right, where the caseworker you have really indicates the success of the placement that you receive as someone in the foster care system. So what we've done is we've partnered with San Joaquin County to apply machine learning and algorithms to optimize the placement of kids, right? We factor for things like family, right? So are they part related to the, to, the, to the kids? Religious preference, language, diet, all these things that, that really factor and contribute to a successful placement are things we're doing today. So that's just one example. Um, you talked to, we talked about Daisy. Sure. Are you asking specifically about Google or like Google and government? Um, the, the, the current things that you find that are important that are your top five things that you're addressing now that we, we, that we may not already know about. Sure. So I would say, you know, when you look at greater Google, one of the, some of the things that we're doing, and, and we can translate this into to what governments need as well, a lot, like we have I.O. this week, which is like Google's big developer conference. One of the big things that they're announcing there is really big additions to what we call Google Lens, which is basically when you take your smartphone out and you like aim the camera at something and ask the camera, what am I seeing? What is in this picture, right? And be able to, to relate that back to what's important to you, right? Because it, it might be, I, I know like for me, like I'll take pictures of things that later on I want to buy or later on I'm just going to do some research on. And so being able to have that pull the information directly off the image so I don't necessarily have to then go do the, the Google search and try to figure out what's inside of that. Right? So how is that impactful for you all? And so that's a huge task that Google's taking on. Think about how much what we would call in this this uh, venue is unstructured data that you might have available to you, right? And so when you think about unstructured data, that's things like images, it's things like PDFs, it's things like documents that you're currently doing on paper, as Andy mentioned. Being able to say what is in that image, what text is in that image, now turning that from this unstructured system of data into something that you can actually do something actionable with is something that's a pure, fantastic use case for, for machine learning. And kind of to Ted's point, that's not, often it's not going to take away from the need for a human to do work at the end of that, but it means that you suddenly don't have to have like a human cataloging a whole bunch of stuff or transcribing something that is already inside of a document and then making that actionable. That's probably one of the biggest areas that, that we're really investing in is being able to take well, whatever you want to call as unstructured, whether that's image data, whether that's video data, um, and turn that into structured data. We tackle some really big problems. I, to answer your question and, and, and to go a little bit broader, some things that we're doing with some other folks. Um, a really great example of this, and, and I was just, cybersecurity, anybody in here in the cybersecurity game? Or worry about it? I see a couple of them. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're, we're worry about it. So if you're in the cybersecurity game and you're trying to protect, let's say, the city of Los Angeles, uh, I work directly, I think Joseph mentioned, with the city of New York's uh, uh, cybercrime team known as Cyber Command. One of the biggest challenges really is to identify things that are really threats that you, or likely really threats, that you want your analysts to spend time on. And an entity the size of the city of LA or the size of the city of New York or the size of Google and our footprint globally, the challenge is to narrow down what essentially amounts to needles in a stack of needles and surface those for a relatively reasonable number of analysts to make a determination as to whether or not a threat is actually a threat. 
And so a great example of using artificial intelligence, machine learning, is actually identifying anomalous events. It's, it's the old one of these things is not like the other. And then to gather the information that surrounds that event and to package it and deliver it for an analyst to be much more responsive. So it appears that we're having somebody attack our firewall. Is that really the case? And should I surface that? So bringing those few needles, those eight out of every hundred, that really do need a person's attention to decide whether or not it's something bad that they need to deal with is a huge way that you can leverage tools like AI and ML with Google. Great first question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Charlene, are you going to do the mic? Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Charlene. Uh, in the last two years, and so we have been starting using some machine learning tools, actually work on some projects. And basically, what we do is that we try to use these tools to extract and organize um, the information from unstructured documents, complex documents, into structured documents so it can be used by other applications. Um, if I say any jargon, and this will probably can make it easier right? <laughs> for other audience. The problem we have is that because the, uh, because as at this time, and this will, most machine learning actually can turn out any result as a supervised learning. And in order to do supervised learning, you need to do the data labeling. And so this is the most time consuming part to labeling the data. And then so we, there's another biggest name in the AI approach us. And then they introduced the Knowledge Studio tool. And then so have very, very big promise. And then we we'll use that to do the data labeling called annotation. Mm -hmm. Basically what it does is that they establish relationship of one word to another word, whatever, make sure to find out the logical relationship there. And then so, but the result is very unsatisfactory. And then so because later we, also because it's so rigid, we cannot even re inject any in human intelligence into the process. And then so that's why it did not work. So we had to using other alternative open source tools like uh, an open source libraries. Actually, we, we turned out probably better results. So my question is that the, does Google provide any better and then so data labeling and then so tools and then so which and it can also for the user to integrate with the uh, human intelligence into the process so to make this a time consuming process and successful because reason being that the other company they fail and the healthcare I think tens of millions of dollars lost because of this they could not do the data labeling in the efficient manner thank you you want me to take it? I'm going to defer I, I, okay. <laughs> um, So first of all, that's an excellent question. Um, second of all, I'm sorry that I'm crackly. Uh, if I were to encapsulate that a little bit, just to, to bring it down, so if, if folks in the audience who are less technical don't, don't know this side of it, the most challenging aspect, in, in all honesty, and I think this gentleman said it correctly, is in order to do machine learning well, you have to have a lot of well-labeled data. And what we mean by labeled data is, as Joseph pointed out, all those pictures of dogs, if you want to teach a system how to recognize dogs, you have to have thousands of pictures of dogs and thousands of pictures of not dogs. And you have to have a label on each one of those to let the, the system know, yes, there's a dog in this picture, no, there is not a dog in that picture. Right? And the more data that you have to train the system, the more accurate it can get as it builds upon that. Right? There's some other caveats on that, but we, we won't get into the rat hole of, of, of how that stuff works. Um, but that generally is, is how it happens. And so then you get into these questions of these systems where it's like, look, yes, Google can do a decent job of recognizing if it's a dog or not a dog using our vision API, right? But that doesn't help you in this specific scenario, right? You have specific unstructured data. You need to be able to determine what's in that specific unstructured data. There's a couple of services that, that we've been working on um, that, that help to, to implement that. So Joseph put this slide together, and I think it's a, it's a helpful thing to, to dive just a touch deeper into. Um, I'm going to point you to that big yellow bar of AutoML. What AutoML is, is that it's a concept, and so for those that are, that are a little bit deeper into um, the technical side, um, you can have a uh, basically transfer the knowledge from one model to another, right? So you don't have to start from scratch to say what's in this picture. You can just say with the cloud one, right? 
I know that these are going to be a whole bunch of stuff, but I want to just call out one element of this is clouds in this picture. Right? I don't need to teach it how to, to see pictures from scratch. I want to be able to transfer the fact that I already have knowledge of what's inside the picture. I just want to refine it to say just this portion. Right? So one of the things that Google has been trying to do is to make it so that you can now transfer those models by just giving us additional, additional labeled data so that you can say, hey, look, this is something that, that I already know a lot about. So Joseph also talked about the, the Secretary of State for State of California with the translation effort um, that we did for the, the voter uh, guides. So that was one where if you just go to Google Translate and you throw in all the voter guide information, it's not going to be perfect, right? It's not, it, there's certain phrases that are very distinct to how the government works. And those distinct phrases have to be translated correct. And because Google works off the internet in terms of how it builds its model, that's not going to be a one-to-one. -one. So what we were able to do with AutoML Translate on this slide is to basically say, OK, here's those specific things. Here's how they specifically need to be translated. Again, using that transfer learning mechanism where you can say, hey, listen, I don't need, you to, I don't need to teach you how to translate to, to Spanish. I just need you to translate to Spanish with some of these contextual clues always given correctly. Right? So that's kind of one big bucket is that we're trying to make it so that without having to recreate models from scratch, right? you don't have to know how to use TensorFlow, which is the language for this, to be able to do it. You just have to give us a whole bunch more labeled data. Now, what I think is your specific question is then what about the labeling process? Right? So we do actually have, um, we're just releasing it now, I believe, um, a service for labeling, right? where you can actually give us something and we'll have folks humans do that labeling process for you, and then it can feed it into whichever mechanism makes the most sense in terms of, of how you would want to, to interpret that data. So we now have, like, you know, uh, folks would call this a mechanical Turk system, right, where you, you actually have humans going through putting labels on data, and then that then feeds into which one, whichever one of those systems that you choose. So I'll add one thing to that. Sometimes the challenge is knowing what data is worth labeling, and so there are times where we actually use uh, tools, AI tools, to identify data that is likely worthwhile to label and then surface those with an individual user so that they can label them or pass on them if they're going to be valuable or not. Um, I think the first question that was brought up right at the very beginning of the session is do you think that AI is going to take over the world, this guy that's here? Um, it, it genuinely takes a lot of work to build out AI and ML. The outcomes from it are amazing. You can do really amazing stuff uh, at reasonable costs very quickly, but it does genuinely take a lot of work to get it where it needs to go. So the human factor is always the biggest piece of it. If you can get more humans effectively labeling data, you can certainly train and retrain your model over and over again as appropriate. And sometimes it's appropriate to use a model to inform what data is likely valuable or worthwhile in training that model. And those are challenges that we've helped some folks face too. When we as a human, we learn something, and we don't need that much data. For example, I look at a document and the human eye, and so maybe even I never know the subject that before. I read it publicly, couple times, and so probably one time, I already know that way to find out the key points, whatever, find that out. But for the machine, and so I think what, what I was experiencing is probably very, very difficult. And then so you need to do a lot of those uh, handhelding. I just wondering that it, does Google uh, does it provide any tools, for example, how to identify the complex document structure and everything that they, because last month you do have a, introduced a new AI platform mm -hmm. and Google last time. So do you have anything new that they, for example, can help and so this aspect, this is actually, this is the most so, difficult aspect of steps. <laughs> yeah, what I would say is uh, I think what we should do is we should take a look, right? Because I don't want to overpromise until we actually look at what ty types of data that you're talking about. So to, to Ryan's point, like, that is the perfect, like, how might we do that with that data set? Um, I'm pretty comfortable to say that we, we probably do have the right tools, but we need to look, right? So I'll... I'll Table it, but please talk to that guy who can <laughs> make sure that you get the right information. So I love Google and I've, I've used a lot of work, but um, I've had resistance to it personally because 
as we're getting older, we're getting we're having diminishing skills, and the idea of something um, thinking of something before you think of it, or you're not having to do that work anymore. You, it feels like you're dumbing yourself down by a machine doing that for you. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you could kind of demystify that. And also, I wanted to know, like, um, writing a, I'm typing a sentence, an email, and then it finishes the thought. Has it learned from me, my style, and what I'm saying? You know? One time, uh, Siri sassed me back. She said something, well, let's not have that. I mean, I was like, how in the world is this machine? Um, is it learning from me specifically, or is it, uh, is it like some big cloud where it's learning these phrases and things, you know? Um, sure. I, I'm just, that's what scares me when yeah. I see, oh, oh, and then I go, oh, they, okay, they finished that. Well, do I want that or not? You know yeah. what I mean? We, we've joked, like, at some point, you'll get to the point where, like, my auto-responses will just have conversation with other people's auto-responses. We don't even have to be involved, right? Um, <laughs> So here's like the, de the demystifying part to your first question of, of, you know, does this start to dumb things down, right? One of the really good, uh, who had this talking point? I'm, I'm totally stealing someone else's talking point, and I'm not giving them specifically credit because I forget who it was. They basically said, think of machine learning like you have a thousand kindergartens, kinder, kindergartners who will actually do what you say, so that's, that's remarkable. Um, and you teach them all how to do one task. That is what machine learning can give you, right? You can take a thousand kindergartners and say, look at these pictures and tell me it, it, what they have in them, right? And they'll be able to do that. But then if you say, you know, like, now prevent road deaths on this, on this now that we know how many cars there are, right? Because I can, I can teach my six-year-old kindergartner how to count how many, how many cars go by. But then how do I prevent death from happening on that road? It, it, like, the leap is too far. Right? So what we're trying to do, and what I believe ML is good at, is it's taking some of those manual processes, things that you could teach a kindergartner, and they're removing those from the equation. Right? So it, it means that you're pushing up a level in terms of what you're requiring out of the human. Right? So the, the human brain is now being asked, Take the thing that makes us different from everything else, which is our ability to predict, our ability to move, you know, like based on what we can see in data, predict into the future what, what that means, right? That's what we're now making it easier to get to that point, right? So that's, that's I think, hopefully to your first question. Um, to the second question, uh, is it learning from you? Qualified, yes, depending. Um, some of the systems do, right? Uh, so there's, there's two parts to that, right? So one is you guys are a G Suite customer as the city of LA. Your, your data is not actually used for training in any circumstance. So because you are, you are uh, an, a governmental entity, we do not put that into our training models. So it's not, if you're like on your work account, it is not learning from your work account. That's just from the, the generic consumer level. If you use Gmail as a consumer, it is learning from you. Right? Not you specifically, and it doesn't deliver a specific model to you, but it is using your, how you respond to emails in order to figure out how people respond to emails. Right? So one of the interesting talks that, that I heard when we were first creating the, the smart responses, right? so it's just kind of like a, you know, it's those like three to five word responses, they actually had to look at that because the most common three word response to every email based on bulk is, anybody have a guess? What's the most common three word response to an email? I haven't heard it yet, I don't think. I love you. Which actually is awesome, right? Like, that speaks well of, of humanity. Um, but we had to, like, we had, we had to bring that back down before we put it into, like, the Gmail auto response thing, especially for, like, enterprises, because that would be super weird if all of your coworkers were just responding with, I love you all the time. Keep making you busy. Right, yeah. Um, so, so we do do a couple things to, to take a look at that. Sorry, I got off track because it's a funny story. Um, one kind of final point that I'll make on it is Google is, and this kind of comes also to what else is Google looking at in this, this space. Um, actually, just again at I.O., we just announced uh, a concept called federated learning. 
Federated learning is doing a lot of these same things, but it does it all on the device itself, so it never actually transits up to the cloud, right? And so what that means is that it'll allow us to do some of these really interesting things, like predictive typing and all that kind of thing, but without it ever actually being something where your personal information is ever somewhere other than on your own device, right? Which is encrypted and all those kinds of good things. So Google, Google cares very much about the privacy aspect of AI. Federated learning is our, our first swag at how we can still deliver all the valuable things that we get out of AI without it necessarily being uh, something that you lose some of the access to your own data. Ethics in AI is a, a, it's a big question, right? Ethics in artificial intelligence has been a topic of conversation for only a few years, really. I mean, it, it's been a, a minor conversation for several. A it was real an academic exercise yeah. for, for years. Yeah. Now it's a real deal. We, we have to evaluate what makes sense to take advantage of AI and ML and put it to work in order to do things. And, and it's definitely a consideration. It's certainly a consideration that we take every time. Um, every product that Google builds starts with you, the user, right? That's for our, from our, our part, our point of view, making sure that it's useful to you, effective for you, and sound is our goal. If you look at the autocorrect that you see in, e or pardon me, the, the autofill that you see when you're typing an email out, if you look at it, you'll go, okay, that makes sense. Because the world is full of information, and a lot of that information passes through Google. Or we scan those web pages when we crawl them so that we can make your searches faster. And contextually, what's there for autocomplete makes sense for what it is that you're typing based against the known English language and all the documentation that exists in history. So it's a, if you can learn from those pieces to shorten the amount of time that it actually takes to get work done, how much more efficient can you be? If you no longer have to load a piece of paper into a typewriter to fill in a form in triplicate and instead can just pull it up on a computer, click four boxes and hit print and be done, you've accelerated the ability to get work done and be more meaningful in your daily operations for everything else that really takes your time investment, takes those minor things away. So there's, understand your concerns certainly, but I think if you kind of look at the depth of it, it's, it's not as intrusive as it feels. Hi, um, can you talk about the applications of AI and ML for social good, specifically at the state or local level? Yeah, so for social good, so you mean, expand on that a little bit more, like so tell me what Topics where... just like homelessness or connecting people to resources, underrepresented voices, equity. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a good question. I, so. I think the way that that could happen, and, and this is honestly one of the areas that I want to turn the mic back to you all because like, I know the technology stuff super duper well. Well, I, I used to, I, I'm a manager now, so I spend less time. Um, sometimes I want to try to, to go back to that problem and say, okay, but what's the most challenging aspect to servicing those people right now, right? Okay, and what part of that challenge is data centric? Those are the things I can fix, right? Like, you know, oftentimes what you can do is you can start to say, really what you want to use AI and ML for is, what part of this is a big data challenge? Okay, that's what I can turn this into, right? So where I would usually look, at, look to for that is, how can I look at whether or not the programs that we are using are effective, right? That's something that you're probably currently measuring. If, you, if you're currently measuring it, it's a good use case for ML. If you're not currently measuring it, I can't, ML is not going to make the magic band-aid, right? And so what I would say there is like, if you know, hey, listen, we spend X amount of dollars doing this service, and we know that we currently get Y out of it, and then you want to predict whether or not, if we changed it, we, if we did the geography a, bit, little, a little bit different, right? So we're going to deploy these resources to this, this zip code instead of this zip code. What would that do, right? And making a predictive model against that. That's something that you can do really well in BigQuery ML, actually. Um, and so you can start to do some things like that, where you're, you're using ML to say, how should we deploy resources? Those are areas where it can help. The other thing that I would say is, um, this actually comes back into Memphis, uh, sorry, the, Oops. I think they're public with it. They, they actually, um, the city that's doing the, the pothole work with us is they're also exploring not just potholes, but they're also trying to say, what else can we detect on cameras? You know, if you think about Google Street View, 
360 degree cameras, if we run some 360 degree cameras, cameras around, we're looking for code violations, right? You could also say, we also want to find where are people living in tents. I want to see if people are, you know, in places that, that are not, uh, you know, like safe for them to be so that we can send people to that area to, to let them know where the shelters are and, and things like that. So again, it's that, that idea that if you can't have a human walking around and cataloging all that information, what can you catalog with, with a camera? Um, I had one more that I was going to... Yeah, absolutely. So medicine is an area where there's a thousand things that we can do with, with ML to, to make that better um, in terms of AI. Jobs API? Yeah, I mean, so that can help to, to facilitate. I, I, I feel like I'm spitballing a little yeah. bit too much at you. So, so. so if I can answer your question, we actually work with a uh, county entity. Come county. use the microphone for people oh, to be able to hear sorry. you. Sorry. We're, we're actually, um, we submitted an RFI uh, response um, on different uh, technologies that can be leveraged to help address some of the homeless issues that the county and the region are really dealing with. So things like uh, Chris mentioned, using a, a ML and AI, and some of the other properties that are inside of Google to help facilitate aligning resources with those in need is really the, the, net, the net story that we want to tell. We can help align resources with need and optimize the way we uh, marshal those resources as well. Great. So I have a question which kind of feedbacks off of that, so I'm glad you asked it first. Um, so A, in terms of it's, it's good to hear you're working with the county, but one of the bigger issues we're having in terms of how we get those resources is essentially the information that is gathered from those in the encampment sometimes fall under laws where information can't be released. Would um, my first question would be since that kind of immersion is seems to be kind of coming soon, would there be a way for Google to be able to synthesize or take that information and say, okay, this is stuff that wouldn't fall under these laws and we can release some of that information to utilize it, which goes to like you were saying, your Google Street View and everything else. And since you're already kind of intertwined with our departments, like lighting and seeing here are kind of in this general area, there's this, like I can tell you there's certain encampments or areas that are known to yeah. always have them. Like how do we take that information and find out, A, how, what are the resources needed here, what's already existing, and how we can kind of translate that quickly, um, both with the infrastructure as well as now with the services, as we're going to be working with the county to say, this general population that is here, we can say, here are the general needs that are needed here, and now we can start deploying these resources. How does that kind of, how do you see AI and some of this kind of <laughs> intertwining with kind of certain laws to address certain things, like the, how do we get these resources to these people? Did you have something you wanted to go with on that? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a super good question. I, so some of it, right, some of it I'm going to, uh, I am going to punt on because it is harder than I can honestly answer in front of you all. I, I think what I would say is we're trying to look at, from a data privacy standpoint, the, the biggest part that we are trying to figure out right now is what can we do to create training models? So uh, I don't want to get too far into the weeds. One of the hardest things about training a model is you have to have huge com computational resources available to you to, to do that, right? That's what cloud is effectively fantastic at. Um, but then there's the, the regulation part of it, of like what can be there and what can't be there, and, and those questions become very important. Google's creating quite a few tools that you can actually deploy locally um, so that the, the data doesn't have to transit to the cloud. You can make the decision. The other nice thing about that is that you can make the decision in real time without having to worry about net network bandwidth. Um, and so some of that is our way of trying to make sure that we can keep the data local and make the decisions local, but then you train in the cloud, so you have to kind of create this training data set. Um, I think in terms of other areas of, of homelessness and, and what you can do there, I, I really do think that the big thing there is probably looking at things like aerial imagery data, um, LIDAR and the rest, and making actionable decisions based on that. Because that's something that you, you often, you in the county will have similar access to. And then you can use that to identify the, the areas that, that need the support the fastest and then make your decisions quicker because of that. That would probably be my first foray into it, but it's honestly an area that I'd want to get more educated on that I could give you a, a better response. And if I can. The other area that I think what we're talking about when we're having these conversations is how do we break down the silos between all the different data that you as providers 
could more effectively use to better service those in need, right? So I think we have some solutions and, and some conversations, frankly, that we need to have so that we can architect and work with you to architect solutions that can help you achieve some of your goals. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's one of the things that Ryan kind of pointed out, right? And I, I will give his team credit for this because they're, they're fantastic at it is, you guys know your, your problem set, we know the technology, and oftentimes that's where you get the really nice synthesis of coming up with a, a really cool solution, right? Because until I understand your problem set well enough, I can't give you the, the answer. But once I get it, like now I'm like, oh, cool, because that's like this other problem that we've already solved, right? And that's where we usually have a, a good crossover. Okay, um, I'm not technical. I'm just a regular person that uses a computer, so I don't know too much about this stuff. But listening to your presentation, I learned about a lot about artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I think a lot of the people in here, or maybe some of the people in here, are over-exaggerating the expectation. I don't want AI to solve, I don't expect AI to solve homeless problems. I don't expect AI to solve, write a document for me. I'm using, I'm thinking of using AI or machine learning as an efficiency tool. I like the concept of putting a camera on a bus, having them find out where potholes are, having them find out where bulky items are, having them find out which lights are out. Because if the city waits for somebody to complain about something, they're not going to get that information. Whereas if it's continually happening, like Google Maps, they're always updating the streets, updating the maps, updating the pictures, then there's no need for us to wait for somebody to complain about a pothole. It will know where the potholes are, then it will use artificial intelligence to say, hey, this is the route you need to take so that you're repairing all the potholes in one efficient way rather than repairing one pothole on the east side of the city, then going all the way to the west side of the city to repair a pothole. Yep. All the information is in there. It's gathered. What is the, uh, because of this, we're city employees, we're government. I know the government is known as not being efficient. So I think this would be a great tool to make the city more efficient rather than having all these inspectors go out and spending all this time driving around looking for these potholes, we could just have it already done automatically. What is the, what is the pushback you're getting from the government why they don't want to participate with Google to do these kinds of things? Truthfully, I haven't seen a lot of pushback there. So then why hasn't it come into play then? I've never, I work for sanitation, I've never yeah. heard any of this. It's, it's only just beginning. It, you know, the, the conversation we're talking about the potholes, it began with, hey, we've got a problem. How could we, what if we, you know, I have this bigger vision around potholes, oddly enough, right? <laughs> I, I think about these things. We all do. We, 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 we tend to geek out about this stuff. What if you went, hey, Google, I want to report a pothole at Third and Vine. And they came back and said, Okay, great. Listen, I've taken your note, but I want to let you know that was reported two days ago. It's scheduled to be repaired tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. What if that happened? How many phone calls would you not get because you have a complaint about a pothole? What if somebody could say, hey, Google, there's a pothole right here? Because they have their phone in their hand. We geomap it. We tie it back to the video stream that's coming in off of the bus. And then we take it a step further. What if the repair crews that are going to go out and fill potholes leave the office in the morning with a map, their route, they know exactly how much hot mix and other materials they're going to need in order to fix the holes that they need to adjust, and at what point in time they should be able to complete those tasks, go back, refill, so they can complete another section. What if you could create that kind of efficiency just by unpacking the data that you already have, adding the other resources that are available to you? You're running city buses, you're running city vehicles, you can gain intelligence to reinforce what you already know and create brilliant efficiencies. And these are the kind of problems we'd love to tackle with you. And I, I'll just add to that. Like, <coughs> we're excited about this as, as how government can change. right? Because I do believe that government can use these types of tools and become that level of, effi of efficient. Um, I don't know what, what it is always that's blocking. Oftentimes, it's procurement rules and things like that. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> but we're excited to, to take the challenges on. I, I think that LA could be that city. I think LA could be the city that, that services its constituents better, faster than, than everyone else. I, I do want to reinforce that these are 
beginning conversations. We're only just getting to have these conversations with many in government. And there are a lot of folks in government who are innovators who are looking for ways to innovate, who need to understand what's available to take advantage of, to leverage, to turn into really meaningful solutions. And we're fortunately in a position where we're starting to have really exciting conversations. And my favorite part about working in the public sector, it's not like working in commercial, right? Where one company's competing with another. Like the things that work for the city of LA, work with the city of San Diego, work with the city of Denver, work with the city of Houston. And there's no pride in ownership. It's creating effectiveness to better take care of the people who live here. And so we've seen a lot of open conversation between governmental entities willing to talk about solutions that have been meaningful to them. And it's really exciting to do in public sector. Hi, my name's Howie. Uh, I have a question about uh, sewer systems. Is there any application yes. that you are involved with, or do you know of any that exist in other cities, government, you know, agencies that something that would benefit sanitation? I work for sanitation too. Yeah. Something um, that's a that's an excellent point and an excellent question because again sewer systems as I said kind of said earlier like anything that it has a tremendous amount of data and good metrics the, at the back end of it is something that you can really easily turn ML against and it does a great job with right so water uh, water quality is one of those things that you can do really really well we have a partner um, AEC is that uh, the right abbreviation um, in any case you can figure that out uh, that actually does that kind of thing they take the sensor data and they can basically turn it around and give you predictive models on you know where do you need to, to replace pipes what where are the problems right so and again this is one of those areas that the hard thing and actually this kind of comes back to the question right why is this hard why is this not as widely as adopted as it could be considering the number of problems that it solves I, I heard Andy kind of say the, the, the name Flint right Flint Michigan the hard part is that this is oftentimes it's a risk-based assessment when you choose to invest in something like this, right? So if, if you knew ahead of time that this was going to be a problem, sure, you'd invest in it now, right? You might spend tens of millions of dollars to prevent having to spend a billion dollars in a year, right? But it's a risk-based assessment, and so oftentimes you're putting these systems in place that are predictive maintenance, so they're, they're intended to make it so that you don't have the breakage. So you often have to have a very future-looking uh, government that can say, hey, look, we have to pre prevent our water systems from breaking down, and we have to use the data that we have available to us to make that possible. Right? So you have to have that in order for this to happen, because otherwise it seems like you're just spending money on top of money that you're already spending. So, sorry, I, I lapsed back. So yes, there's a lot in sanitation, there's a lot in water um, that we're already doing. We have a really good partner that, that is already doing that against sensors, and that, uh, that also brings me to another point that I was going to make, I forgot. Um, same kind of thing with like air quality, right? Like there's actually a huge discrepancy from block to block in air quality. And that's a really hard thing to figure out without using uh, AI and ML to, to be able to do that. So we also have a partner that can actually help catalog what your air quality is so that you can then also figure out where you need to put inspectors to, to factories and to plants and things like that um, that might be the offenders that are putting the, the types of things out into the air that you don't want. You also talk about floods using sensors yeah, so we've, we've done quite a bit of work uh, in a couple of different areas um, for just flood detection systems. So some of that is you have to understand where your floodplain is. So again, this, this often come, works in conjunction with your GIS information, your, your uh, geography information. Being able to say, like, where, where do you have impervious surfaces where the water is going to flow off of? And then being able to map those things to, to where you're going to potentially have floods occur. Um, I believe City of Houston's using us for that. They, they, they prevented, well, uh, they didn't prevent. Uh, they were able to map out some of the, the things that they needed to change. Um, so there are quite a few systems like that that are also good use cases uh, for ML. Do we have time for another couple of questions, or we we need to switch? I have one uh, okay. regarding Google Drive. Oh hi, there Google you Drive, Google Cloud. How safe is our data? Is it is it impossible to lose? Do you guys have a fail-safe system where you've got? multiple backups in multiple locations? Can we so, rest assured that we don't have to back it up uh, manually ourselves? So your data uh, in Drive and Cloud, depending on which service you use, has 12 nines of redundancy. Um, and so it, that's just a super technical term. What that means is that if we lose your data, something terrible has happened to this planet. Um, <laughs> and you probably won't care as much about that document. Um, 
Uh, so taking a step back though, like the, the reality is, is Google, a, Google's very good at that just from a, from a redundancy standpoint, right? Because we, we, we don't ever put one file on one disk and then just cross our fingers that that disk is gonna survive, right? Every time you upload any data into Google, it automatically shards itself into thousands of pieces. Those thousands of pieces go onto thousands of servers. Those thousands of servers are replicated across regions. One step back, what, I, the sharding process, the encryption too. I'll get there. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so across all of that, it's, it's super duper redundant. Uh, to Andy's point, um, all of that is also encrypted in transit and rest. Each individual shard, in fact, those meaningless pieces of data are individually encrypted with separate in encryption keys sent off to a key encryption management server, um, which what I always think about this, there, there is a good line that I am stealing from another person. Um, it's a computer science miracle that this all happens in real time, right? If you've used Google Docs and like you've got like five people all writing in a doc at the same time, that file is being saved every few milliseconds up to our servers being sharded into thousands of pieces, each piece is being encrypted and then sent off to this other person who's also using that same file, right? That's all happening underneath the hood without you ever seeing it. Um, so yes, it is fully safe, uh, and also from just a compliance standpoint, um, just to be crystal crystal clear, like you guys as the city of LA own all of that data, that is your data, Google does not use that in terms of our own learning, our own machine learning algorithms for ads, all that kind of stuff. So from a safety perspective, you can put, with some caveats, uh, you can put any file type, anything that you want in there, and you can rest assured that it is safe uh, in Google system, right? So the, the only caveats that I actually have is ITAR data. You can't put that in there because that's actually weapons defense stuff. Um, so that one is like a slightly bigger caveat, but otherwise you're, you're good to go. Yes, sir. I'm a programmer with the city of Los Angeles. So you've already been mentioning training tools and I'm just salivating over the tools and the training and the knowledge base that you guys will make, I mean, available for us. Uh, I'm also asking what incentives for developers are you guys providing so that we can uh, help um, the city, uh, I guess, realize some of these solutions with possible applications that is. Thank you for the question. Um, so to answer your question, we're working directly with ITA to provide those resources to you, both in the form of self-service online um, courses that can instruct you in the use of that, as well as with services and systems that allow you to have temporary Google credentials and actually stand up real environments to have a temporary place for you to perform those activities to say, for example, turn on virtual private networks or to deploy a uh, load balancer and to have that be able to be a training exercise with real console, real environments, and then being able to, to have the system automatically spin that down for you. So to answer your question, we're working directly with ITA and we're in process to uh, get, that, get that taken care of to provide to you. But we do have an ITA representative. We're gonna end the questions for Google at this point. We're gonna open it up again. But Hunter is gonna talk about how ITA has identified some of those and how you, if you have an, a project that you wanna talk about, you can go directly to Hunter. He's our local data scientist that's taking a lot of different projects. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Hunter Owens. I'm a programmer analyst and data scientist in the uh, relatively nascent citywide data science and predictive analytics team at the city of LA. First, how many of you knew that the city had a data science team? All right, how many of you now know that? <laughs> Great. <laughs> Uh, we exist. Uh, there are four of us. Uh, we are in ITA, but as you notice, our name, okay, our name, uh, hopefully it will stop yelling at me. Um, our name is Citywide, so we're here to help you. Um, ITA, as you know, we're not exactly the most public-facing agency. I think more people know it, like sanitation exists, because they see your trucks all over the place. Most people don't necessarily know we exist, but we're here to help you. Um, so we've been around for uh, coming up two, two and a half years. We want to thank both Ted Ross, who you met earlier, and Gene Holm, who have been sponsoring this, our executives. Um, but to help support that data science challenges and machine learning challenges to city challenges mapping. Uh, so we started something called the Data Science Federation. Um, this was started in 2016. I know some of you here have done projects with us. Um, we work with local universities and city resources and uh, cloud providers, Google et al, um, to help better uh, 
bring folks who can help execute on this and prototype and experiment with new data science work. Because um, it turns out there's this whole pile of universities who love to work on public sector challenges and work with our data, even including like helping you clean up your data. Um, so pretty much the way it works, it's actually grown quite a bit over the few years, and I'm going to give you the very quick history, is we work with colleges and universities to help bring city, uh, city challenges out towards them. We negotiate data sharing agreements, non-disclosure agreements, I can do all the legal stuff so you can work directly with Cal State LA or UCLA, USC. We have uh, 17 universities uh, partnered. We've worked on 30 plus city projects over the years and engaged over 300 students. Um, uh, since we've gotten started, actually for cities outside of LA, the Southern California Association of Governments has sort of adopted this in a little bit of a way. So now other cities such as Santa Monica, Pasadena can take advantage of this as well. But we're still here to help you. Um, but really what I'm here to talk about is what exactly is a project to us? You know, for our Data Science Federation, it often means we can uh, do things in a quarter or a year. Um, doesn't often involve super sensitive data, um, and it creates these one projects that city departments propose. Um, I should mention that that is not just what we do. We have a whole bunch of other functions, um, you know, our group. Um, so I wanted to just sort of uh, say that, but the really crucial timing here is we are actually asking city departments to submit new projects right now. So this is the big uh, takeaway, which is that uh, right now, we are looking for new projects to go ahead. So last year, we did 24 different projects um, were submitted. 18 of them were matched. Um, so what we do is we have a whole process to help you figure out what exactly is a data science project? What exactly data do I have? We schedule meetings. Um, there's, we have scoping document templates. And once we've gotten that, you know, oh man, I think I could use machine learning to do something around homelessness, which is an example to, here is an actual project around, say, affordable housing uh, construction rates in certain neighborhoods. That's, that's the hardest thing in data science. Like, I will maintain the computer stuff is easy. There are lots of people who are smart at math. There are not many people who, are very, who have an idea of how to map their, like, what is going on in their day job and people's day jobs into the math. Like, so the thing that we spend our time on is helping you figure out, like, how to get to a project that's doable and is going to help you and help sort of be that augmented intelligence, as Ted mentioned. So if you have an idea, does anybody have an idea they've got kicking around in the tires of the head and all this Google stuff? Somebody's thinking about something. Um, we would then set up a scoping media and dating re data review. So this is a chance for us just to show you our scoping templates. Um, it would show you, we'd go over what data you have. Um, can't do data science without data. Um, so, and then you'd submit a proposal. Uh, then we match it with local universities. So you might say like there's UCLA statistics department. They have graduate students who have to spend one year working on a statistics graduate colloquium. So they'll be, uh, we often match with that program. You know, if you've got a particularly stats heavy da data challenge, a lot around demography they're really good at. So we'll match, you know, your challenge with a university that's, you know, knows a little bit about your problem domain, uh, gets set. Then we, project starts, and then they, um, all the stuff is owned by the city. They'll give you presentations. You'll do weekly updates. There's a handoff. Um, so that's sort of like the pipeline at a very 3,000 foot view. There's some template stuff, but really the crucial thing here is um, the call for projects is open. Uh, May for June, uh, we're looking for these project scoping sessions to happen, and on July 12th, those scoping documents are due, filled out to us so that we can get projects going for the year ahead, um, and we'll be sending them out for the fall. So, and then obviously this part of the timeline matters more if you're like a professor and you'd like to have research, uh, you'd like to um, get uh, things. So, some quick uh, FAQ things. Does this cost city departments any money? The answer is no. So that always is uh, really helpful. Uh, all these projects do result in stuff that the city can then adopt. Um, sometimes these projects get grant funding. We've been working with DOT on a lot of machine vision stuff as well that has received over a million dollars in grant funding at this point. Um, similar to what you saw CDOT is doing, but more focused on bicycles and pedestrians and our ATSAC camera network, which has its own sort of weird subspecialties. And we've done, you know, 25, 30 projects. Um, so you know that uh, Joe, they were like, well, how do I get involved? Well, here's the thing is I am actually asking you all to email me. Um, so please email us and the team at itadata at lacity.org if you have an interest in a project or starting one. 
Uh, we have quarterly meetings where we present on some of these projects. So if you'd like to just even, I don't even have a project idea right now, just please sign me up for your mailing list so you can stay involved. Um, email us. Um, if you're like, I'm not sure, I'm confused, I have this pile of data, like please just don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you know, I've been doing data science and local government for, uh, well, my career is relatively nascent. I know I don't have uh, uh, all the years that some of you guys have here. Uh, I've been at the city for three and I was doing this before for four years behind that. So I've been doing this as long as this field's been a thing. And you can see really, when you, you get to the point, you can see really excellent results. So I wanted to, again, go back. I know people have tons of questions, but we're really, we are looking for projects right now and we would be happy to partner with you, uh, whether department, proprietary, um, so please don't hesitate, reach out and email. Um, questions? Can you give an idea of the type of projects that you've done? Yeah, so a couple projects we did. Um, Office of Finance, uh, they have auditors. Um, they have, they can audit like maybe 0.5% of the total number of businesses in LA that are possible. So we worked with Claremont Graduate University and the Office of Finance to predict which businesses are most likely to be committing tax fraud, essentially. Um, <laughs> and it's good because, like, look, nobody wants to get audited, right? So if we can make sure that we're auditing the businesses that are, need to be audited and not auditing the businesses that don't need to be audited, it's a better experience for those. So we were able to double, the, we, were, we were able to show that we'd see a doubling of the rate. We're still working on getting this into production and testing. This is all this, all this stuff is hard, but in our testing, in our initial testing, we were able to double the rate of successful audits. That is, the audit results in us recovering more money than time we spent doing the audit. Um, we were able to double that. So instead, of, for all the businesses we audited, instead of 20% of the audits being successful, we, if we had targeted, it would have been 40%. Um, we're working with DOT um, uh, on uh, counting bicyclists and pedestrians using ATSAC cameras. We actually have, unlike Colorado, we have these sensors in our lanes for cars, if you've ever seen those circles. I know the DOT folks know this better than I do, so if I botch this, please yell at me uh, afterwards. But we can count cars really well, but we can't necessarily count bicyclists and pedestrians as well. And the uh, it turns out a magnetic sensor works really well for a 2,000 pound car, works less well for the 200 uh, pound hunter. Um, so uh, it will not pick me up, so we're able to use uh, the existing camera network to automatically count bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, so those are a couple. We've worked uh, on dashboard projects with, you know, sanitation and HCID. Um, there's a whole listing on our website. So if you go to dsf.lacity.org, we have all of our projects listed out, or at least all the ones we can talk about so far. So, yeah. That's dsf.lacity.org. And we'll send out links to that inside the presentation. Does anyone have, does anyone have any additional questions for Hunter or I guess the Google team left? Anyone else? Someone way back here. Good morning. Uh, my question is, uh, we are getting more information. We're getting more technical. We're acquiring more work. And we're getting more efficient. And we're measuring the potholes. But we still need the people. Yeah, I would say at least 50% of the projects I've seen is almost justification for more people. Um, identifying needs is one of the biggest challenges. Um, it's, I'll, it's, we all know how city government is, budget, you know, we're coming up to the end of a budget cycle here. Um, a lot of our projects have been that we don't necessarily know where the need is. Um, you know, uh, sometimes we have a little bit of data, but uh, a lot of times it's predicting how much need is out there, because once you can predict how much need is out there, you can then say, all right, this is how many humans to actually, you cannot, you know, as they said, you know, you can't fill a pothole with a computer. You can find out where the potholes are, you can know an inventory of potholes, but uh, to my knowledge, no pothole filling robots coming up in the Next pipeline. Year. Next year. All right, apparently, uh, but uh, so I think that's one of the strongest areas where this work can help is help justifying where the need is and we're happy to help try to figure out what a project looks like for that for you. And I want to add to that because that is actually something that we've, we've done in other places. Um, the, you know, like uh, we, we've talked to a couple of different parks and recs departments, right? Because they, they often have this challenge of, you know, in, 
in city government, you get to justify your existence every year, right? Like, and whether or not you should have the budget that you have. And oftentimes it's hard for them to, to be able to extrapolate, kind of similar to what you were talking about with like the bikes and, and pedestrians, how many people are attending my park, right? Like how, how many constituents get good value out of this, right? And so we've been actually working with a couple of those to use some of those object detection methods to say, okay, how many, if you just have a camera pointed at the park, how many distinct individuals have visited the park in this, this time frame, right? And what their hope is, is to be able to turn that around as justification for additional resources. Right, so again, like that is 100% a hope of being able to turn more people around to more parks departments to be able to, to, to justify the, the dollars that are being spent there. Right, so very often, I want, you, I, I want you to come away with the, uh, the impression that this is not intended to automate away all of the jobs that you currently have. It's much more to just say, hey, listen, can we automate some of these parts of it that then justify cool new things that we can work on? 